Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeads. Welcome to video notes for topic 9.5, which is global climate change. This is a really massive topic in the course and exam description. It has a ton of essential knowledge. And so we're gonna break this up into two videos and today we'll just be covering part one. Today's objective is to be able to explain how both short and long-term changes in Earth's climate will impact Earth's ecosystems. And the skill that we'll be practicing at the end of today's video is using data to support a hypothesis. So before we talk about more short-term anthropogenic or human-driven climate change, we need to talk about historic long-term climate change that happens more naturally. This happens as a result of Earth's bearing orbit. And so Earth's orbit around the sun is not fixed. It's not constant. It changes slightly over time. The first change we'll talk about is eccentricity. Eccentricity is how Earth's orbit changes with regard to how circular it is. And so at times, Earth's orbit is almost perfectly circular. But at other times, it becomes a little bit more eccentric or it moves a little bit further away from the sun. This GIF here shows us a great example of this. Now it's exaggerated so that we can actually see it. The change is much more slight than this. But this helps us understand how on a roughly 100,000 year cycle, Earth's orbit is going to change from being slightly closer to the sun to slightly further away from the sun, again, based on this eccentricity. The second way that Earth's orbit changes is obliquity. Obliquity refers to how oblique or how tilted Earth's axis is towards the sun. Now, this is really important because at times this will result in Earth's northern latitudes, which have the majority of Earth's ice, receiving either more direct or less direct sunlight. So when the Earth's axis is tilted closer to the sun or further towards it, those northern latitudes get exposed to more direct insulation. That's going to lead to melting of the polar ice caps and it's going to lead to slightly warmer periods of time on Earth. When the obliquity or the obliqueness of Earth's tilt moves away from the sun, these northern latitudes get a little bit less direct insulation. That's going to lead to cooler periods of time. And so both of these cycles combined are going to lead to what are called Milankovitch cycles. Milankovitch cycles are predictable, roughly 100,000 year variations in Earth's climate that again result from how direct or indirect the Earth is receiving solar radiation. After taking a look at how Earth's orbit changes and affects insulation, now we need to look at how we actually know that climate has varied over time. So scientists use three main pieces of evidence to establish Earth's temperature and Earth's carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere over the past 800,000 years. So the first line of evidence is the shells of tiny organisms called foraminifera. These are organisms that are found on the ocean floor. And so when they die, their shells become part of sediment layers that are deposited. Now we can dig up these layers and based on the age of the layers, we can establish which species of foraminifera were present or most abundant during that time. Now, because different species have different temperature preferences, we can use these layers of sediment on the ocean floor as a reliable predictor of Earth's temperature at different periods of time. We also have air bubbles that form in ice cores. And so because ice forms at a predictable rate, different layers of ice from different periods of time on Earth contain bubbles that are actually tiny little snapshots of the atmosphere during that time. So scientists can drill down and take out a core, which is a really long section of ice that contains bubbles from thousands and thousands of different years apart, so different periods of time. And when they melt those ice cores, they can test the air in those bubbles to see what were the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere when that layer of ice formed. So this also allows scientists to look at carbon dioxide levels historically. And then finally, scientists can use oxygen isotopes to also estimate the temperature on Earth from different periods of time. So by looking at the isotopes of oxygen, specifically heavy oxygen, so oxygen 18, and its relative abundance to oxygen 16, scientists can establish what the likely temperature on Earth was at different periods of time when different ice layers or different sediment layers formed. Now we know this because more oxygen 18 or more heavy oxygen isotopes present in a sample will indicate that there was likely a warmer period of time. So by lining up all three pieces of evidence, scientists can get a pretty reliable picture of what Earth's climate has looked like for the past 800,000 years. So what you'll notice here is that in red, we have pretty consistent temperature variance over the past 800,000 years. And remember, this is due to the Milankovitch cycles. So Earth's going to experience roughly every 100,000 years an ice age. This is a period of time where Earth is receiving less direct solar uh, insulation when the eccentricity may be taking the Earth a little bit further away from the sun and the obliquity may be tilting a little bit further away. And so all of this is going to lead to cooler temperatures and massive uh, ice formation. So we get ice ages. 
Then we see uh, in between those ice ages, periods of warmer time on Earth. So these are really predictable. And again, scientists believe that this is due to these Milankovitch cycles. What we can also see is that carbon dioxide and temperature on Earth is strongly correlated. So in the blue, we have carbon dioxide and we can see how consistently those two attributes of Earth's climate have lined up over time. Now, the tricky part is knowing the exact causality of their relationship. So we know that increasing carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere in the short term will trap more heat in Earth and it will lead to a warmer planet. But we also know that as the climate warms, the oceans warm and more carbon dioxide is released from the oceans. And so scientists don't understand the exact and precise causality between carbon dioxide and Earth's atmospheric temperature. Again, we do know that in the short term, as we add more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, we are warming the atmosphere. And we can see that dramatically here in the chart as these carbon dioxide levels that we're experiencing currently are far higher than at any point in the past 800,000 years. So that is cause for concern. That's reason to be concerned about how that's going to change temperature in the short term. But we also have to understand that there is some impact that temperature has on carbon dioxide as well. And so this is the great thing about science. We're still exploring this, we're still learning this, and we don't understand the relationship perfectly. One thing I do wanna point out though, and again, I try to be really weary. I'm not pushing environmentalism because this is an environmental science course. So we wanna to stick to the science, but because of the short-term implications and the strength of the correlation between increasing carbon dioxide and increasing temperatures on earth, and because of the impacts of those temperature increases, we need to be concerned about this. It is rightfully concerning to scientists and to global citizens, anyone who calls Earth home, should be concerned and should be interested in how this relationship works. So just because we don't understand the exact nature of carbon dioxide and temperatures relationship does not mean that we should not be concerned about decreasing our carbon dioxide emissions in the short term. Now we'll take a look at some of the effects of climate change. So the first and probably the most pressing on everyone's mind is global warming. So we are expecting there to continue to be a trend of increased average surface temperature on Earth. And so that leads to some consequences. Some of those consequences for ecosystems specifically would be the loss of certain habitats. Certain habitats will become too dry. They won't receive enough precipitation. So we could lose those habitats, which could result in the loss of those species as well. So we know that currently we're seeing large rates of extinction on Earth far, far, far faster than background extinction rates that we would expect. Um, some scientists have even put forth the idea that we are in the midst of a sixth mass extinction. There's a book written on this topic. And so we are expecting biodiversity loss to continue with continued climate change. And drought is another impact. So as certain regions become drier due to increased solar radiation, increased evaporation, and changing wind patterns, those regions are expected to experience prolonged drought. Now, I want to point out that some regions are expected to actually experience increased precipitation. And this happens for the same reason, increased temperature on certain regions, driving increased evaporation and shifting atmospheric patterns resulting in more precipitation in certain regions. Specifically, the tropics are expected to expand and we'll talk more about that shortly. Another cause though, or another consequence of climate change is soil desiccation. So as temperatures rise, many soils will become so dry that they can't hold moisture anymore and really can't support agricultural crops or natural plant life. And so these are all some large scale consequences of rising temperature on earth, especially with reference to ecosystems. Then we have rising sea level, which we've covered quite a bit, especially in video 9.4. So you can head back and take a look at that if you want a more in-depth description of this. But basically as glacial and polar ice is melting, more water's being added to the ocean, which is increasing sea level. We also have thermal expansion. And we'll talk about the consequences for marine ecosystems and co coastal ecosystems uh, coming up in this unit yet. Then finally, we have melting of the permafrost. This is a big consequence that will be a focus of the second half of this video, but we're going to introduce the idea here. So the permafrost is this area of permanently frozen ground that occurs in the tundra. And the problem with a warming climate is that it leads to melting of the permafrost, which leads to these large pools of water that just sit there and basically drive anaerobic decomposition. So that's the breakdown of the organic matter, the grass, the roots, you know, the plant matter underneath those pools of water. And when you have anaerobic respiration, you give off methane and carbon dioxide. So as the permafrost melts, it releases a lot of methane and a lot of carbon dioxide. 
We know that those are both greenhouse gases, so we know that they trap heat in Earth's atmosphere and they warm the climate. That drives even further melting of the permafrost, which releases more and more carbon dioxide and methane, which increases temperature more. And so we can quickly see that this creates a vicious cycle, uh, and we refer to that as a positive feedback loop. Next, we're going to briefly look at some more projections or more risks that Earth is expected to experience as the climate continues to warm. So this is a chart put out by the International Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, and they've predicted that if Earth continues to warm to two degrees Celsius by the year 2100, we have some serious risks to ecosystems on Earth. We can see that the threat to ecosystems is very high. So again, this is the likelihood that certain ecosystems will be lost or shift or shrink in, in their range on Earth. But we also have an increase in a lot of other potential risks, things like extreme weather events, things like the coral die off. So we'll talk about coral bleaching in 9.6. We also have coastal flooding, which is a topic that we'll cover shortly. And so we can see there are a lot of risks on Earth, specifically to ecosystems and to people with a rising global temperature. Now we'll talk more specifically at impacts to coastal communities. So as sea level rises, many coastal communities are going to be displaced. So coastal communities that are not wealthy enough to build higher seawalls or to put their houses on stilts or move development back from the shore will likely be forced to become refugees. They'll have to leave their home. Uh, and this is something that we covered again in 9.4, but I wanted to touch on again here. And so, you know, some cities or some areas that are going to be more developed, that are going to have more wealth and more resources, they may be able to build higher seawalls or they may be able to build homes up on stilts or build pump infrastructure or things to, you know, send the seawater back out. This is really only going to delay what looks to be the inevitable, though, as this trend in rising sea level appears to be continuing and not slowing down anytime soon. Uh, another threat is the threat of losing barrier islands. And so these are small kind of shoals of land or little bits of land just off the shore that do a buffering service to the shoreline. And so they're going to block some of the wind and some of the force of waves, and they can help protect shorelines and prevent them from the eroding forces of waves and of wind. The problem though is that as sea level rises, we start to lose these barrier islands. And we, we can see in this GIF here, as the sea levels rise, they're gonna go right up over those barrier islands and they're basically going to inundate them with water or they're gonna flood them. And so those barrier islands no longer serve as a habitat. So we lose a rich you know, beach and, and intertidal zone habitat oftentimes, as well as the buffering service that was provided to those coastal communities. And so these are two more threats that occur with rising sea level. Next, we'll take a look at the impact of global climate change on atmospheric circulation. So the Hadley cell, which we covered in unit four, is expected to both widen and weaken as a result of climate change. This is because the temperature differential between the poles and the equator is expected to decrease as the poles are warming faster than any other region on Earth. So let's take a look at how the Hadley cell currently functions and how it's expected to change as a result of climate change. So if we take a look at the Hadley cell here, I will draw in some helpful arrows. We know that air rises at the equator because the sunlight is most direct there and warm air rises. It then spreads out as it expands and cools. And then eventually it sinks back down to earth at roughly 30 degrees north and roughly 30 degrees south. So this is the current pattern that we see with the Hadley cell. But what's happening is that each year as the Arctic area warms further and becomes closer in temperature to the equator is that the Hadley cell expands a little bit. And the reason for this is that the Hadley cell sinking here at 30 degrees is the result of this cold air mass from the polar regions cooling this warm air expanding from the equator and causing it to sink. So again, as that temperature differential changes, the Hadley cell is going to expand further out each year from 30 degrees north, and the same trend should happen in the south. And so what are the consequences of this? Well, part of the consequences will be that we would expect the subtropical regions or zones to shift. And so the subtropical zones from 30 degrees are going to shift further up. And so we're going to get drier weather that's going to occur in the 30 to 60 degree range because of the shifting Hadley cell. Another impact that's expected to occur because of this change in the temperature differential between the equator and the poles is a weakening and destabilization of the polar jet stream. So let's first talk about what the polar jet stream is, and then we'll talk about how climate change is weakening it. 
And so if we take a look at the polar jet stream, it exists because we have both a temperature and pressure differential between the polar region and the subtropical regions. We have low pressure at the polar regions and high pressure in the subtropical regions. What that leads to is a really strong and consistent jet stream where we have air moving west in a fairly consistent latitude. Again, that's because we have roughly uh, equal pressure systems here on either side that are keeping it fairly consistent. So because that temperature and that pressure differential between the poles and the equator is what actually drives the jet stream, as that temperature pressure differential decreases, we see a destabilized and a wobblier jet stream. So if we take a look here at the jet stream, we can kind of understand here, as these uh, pressure changes become less pronounced, we can get warm air uh, that can drive this high pressure system further. And what that's going to do is expand the jet stream north in certain regions. And now the jet stream is kind of like a rope or kind of like a hose. And so when it moves in one direction, another part of the jet stream has to move in an opposite direction. It kind of ripples almost. And so what happens is when we get warm uh, patterns that occur, you know, in the Western United States with those ocean currents, that's going to push up on the jet stream, which is then going to result in it being pushed down or south in the Eastern United States. And if we want to look at the implications specifically for uh, the U.S., we can look at this map here, which will help us understand that ripple effect in a little bit more detail. So again, we want to look here and concentrate on this warm air system that forms on the coast of California with this warm ocean circulation. And so that's going to exert northward pressure on the jet stream is going to shift the jet stream north. But then what happens is it shifts further south over the eastern U.S. and the Midwest. And this was actually responsible for the polar vortex that we experienced in 2014. So if you live in the Midwest or you live on the eastern seaboard and you remember that extremely cold, extremely snowy 2014 that we had, uh, meteorologists and scientists believe this was due to a wobbly destabilized jet stream, which can be attributed to climate change. So for practice FRQ 9.5, I want you to look at this map of the United States and the temperatures experienced in different regions and try to explain how these data support the hypothesis that a destabilized jet stream was responsible for the cold spell experienced in the Midwest.